Bob Riley, the director of the Westminster Institute, and welcome to our ongoing series of lectures and discussions. Today, we're talking with Nuri Turkle, who's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and who serves as a commissioner to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Mr. Turkle was born in a re-education camp at the height of China's cultural revolution and spent the first several months of his life in detention with his mother. He came to the United States in 1995 as a student and was later granted asylum by the U.S. government. Mr. Turkle received an MA in International Relations and a JD from the American University here in Washington, D.C. In addition to his professional career, he's promoted Wigger human rights and universal democratic norms. He is the chairman of the board for the Wigger Human Rights Project, which he co-founded in 2003. Previously, he served as the president of the Wigger American Association. Since, since 2011, Mr. Turkle has successfully represented a substantial number of Wigger political refugees with their asylum applications in the United States. He has been published in the Wall Street Journal, Time, Newsweek, Foreign Policy, and other prestigious venues. Nuri has testified for Congress, including most recently in May on the atrocities against Uyghurs and other minorities in Xinjiang. Many of his recommendations have been incorporated into U.S. laws and pending bills relating to Uyghurs in China, including the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2020. In May, Fortune magazine named him one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. Today, we're going to discuss the strategic significance of China's Uyghur genocide in the 21st century order. Welcome to the program, Nuri Turkle. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you on these important issues. Well, perhaps you could begin by putting this issue in context with also some history of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and their relationship to China. I know back in 1949, there was a brief period of independence. Then what happened? The international community just found out about the brutal nature of the CCP's decades old uh, repression of the Uyghurs uh, along with the other non uh, Han Chinese uh, major, minority population in China. Uh, it took a genocide uh, in the Uyghur homeland, East Turkestan, uh, upending of the rule of law, democratic freedom in Hong Kong uh, for the international community to find out what this regime in Beijing really is about. Uh, Uyghur people have been subject to various forms of uh, political repression uh, since uh, Mao's occupation of the Uyghur's homeland in 1949 with the help of Stalin. Uh, early on, they used uh, some of the uh, common forms of uh, repression, uh, but starting in the early 90s, uh, particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the emergency of the uh, uh, independent nations in the Uyghur's backyard on the other side of the border, the Chinese authorities felt that the Uyghurs may demand a uh, similar type of uh, freedom, uh, sovereignty from the PRC. So they used their influence in the region, uh, rallied support in a much smaller scale as in comparison to what we're seeing today. Uh, with the help of so, uh, Russia, they built, established this thing called uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SEO is the acronym. With the SEO's help, uh, the Chinese uh, pressured, uh, intensified the pressure, not only on the Uyghurs living within the Chinese boundaries, but also they are also uh, uh, pressuring the neighboring countries not to support. So this was in 1995 uh, uh, towards the end of the 90s. And then the 9-11 gave them another opportunity uh, to use the US-led uh, war on terrorism an, as an excuse, which they still do to this day, 
to tell the world that the Uyghurs are the Muslim uh, terrorists that poses a similar type of threat as the other Muslim groups do uh, on, in the West, basically, the United States, which has been uh, rebuked by both uh, previous Secretary of State and the current Secretary of State. As you may recall, Secretary Pompeo revoked this decision uh, made by the Bush administration designating a uh, obscure organization as a terrorist organization, which Secretary Pompeo revoked. And also recently, Secretary Blinken also said uh, on his uh, one of his interviews that uh, the way that the China sees uh, the security threat is not the same way that we see it. So that so much so for China's security claim, and it's it's been uh, very effective uh, in their uh, diplom diplomatic efforts to buy out silence uh, or pressure, harass weaker countries to get on their side. And then fast forward, uh, starting 2009, after the um, the uh, ethnic clash in the regional capital Urumqi, uh, the Chinese uh, given up. Uh, something that they were pre previously using, carrot and stick policy, to switch to uh, stick only approach. A recently published New Yorker uh, uh, piece, uh, a long piece, future story, profiling a former camp uh, detainee survivor, uh, gives a good overview of the transition from carrot and stick to stick only policy that's been implemented. And this takes us to Xi Jinping era. Uh, after Xi Jinping come to power in 2013, 2012, uh, with uh, this leaked document now been publicly circulated, number nine document uh, in 2013, Xi Jinping and his uh, supporters within the Communist Party uh, decided to, to do a couple of things. Uh, one, take out anything that is uh, making noise will potentially pose threat uh, to the state, uh, to the party, to Xi Jinping's authority. And then globally, they're using uh, their technological advantages, uh, economic uh, influence to buy out uh, silence, as well as expanding uh, their way of uh, governance, uh, authoritarian governance, which was widely uh, discussed in the previous administration, uh, as you may recall, Secretary Pompeo made a number of speeches on this uh, initiative uh, and implementation of Xi Jinping's worldview. So in 2015, uh, Xi Jinping was advised by his advisors that they got to be a final solution to the Xinjiang problem. Um, that, that's an eerie phrase to use, the final solution. Yeah, they call the Xinjiang uh, final solution to the Xinjiang problem. Oh my. Uh, they didn't specifically mention the name of the ethnic group, but the geographic reference is, is bone chilling. So with, with that, uh, Xi Jinping uh, authority and himself, someone who is so fixated, so focused on the stability concern, thought that was a good idea. Uh, and then in August 2016, Xi Jinping put in power someone by the name Chen Quanguo, uh, who was a party secretary in Tibet. Uh, and he essentially got promoted from being a party secretary in Tibet to party secretary in Xinjiang. Uh, he was given an, all the necessary tools in this New Yorker piece, uh, even reports that he built a fortress-like uh, campaign that is his command center, uh, controlling uh, the information, uh, surveillance apparatus, policy making. He worked and lived in that compound. So this man was um, sanctioned under the Global Magnitsky Act last year. Uh, the Trump administration sanctioned him. And it was the first time that the United States government used uh, the legal tools, this effective legal tools to sanction somebody who is in actually a, a significant political position within the Chinese system. So, um, so this has been an uh, ongoing process uh, and now become a very personal uh, matter for Xi Jinping and his supporters. Uh, this has become a global uh, issue. Uh, the reason is being that uh, 
if you look at the way that the Uyghur genocide been designed, uh, enforced, implemented now, uh, quite shamelessly uh, justified uh, through China's official mouthpiece um, media outlets uh, and also their diplomats uh, using our social media to uh, engage in genocide denial. Uh, recently, one of the most senior Chinese diplomats, Sui Tian Kei, showed up on CNN uh, quite comfortably said that this is where we are. Americans need to get used to it. And then he also said that uh, there's no such a thing called genocide because the Uyghur people are happy, their homeland is beautiful. And, and uh, so, so the point is that they are uh, uh, using this issue actually to rally support in addition to justifying. Another interesting aspect, technology. Uh, Australian uh, a, a think tank, Australian Policy Strategic Policy Institute profiled a technology firms, uh, uh, apparel in, uh, the, the companies in the, uh, from the apparel industry using forced labor uh, for so long. Uh, over 80 global brands were implicated in this report. Uh, the United States Congress is actively legislating uh, a bill, a, le a legislative mandate to address this modern day slavery. And there's another aspect, uh, which is, um, the expansion of authoritarianism. The Chinese uh, use the very, uh, use Uyghur's homeland and their lives to test this uh, surveillance, most uh, intrusive form of surveillance techniques, uh, now uh, actively expanding it. Uh, last year, uh, the commission that I'm serving hold a hearing, one of our witnesses, a China scholar who monitors and research these issues told us that uh, over 80 countries uh, already have adopted Chinese surveillance technique, techniques. Why this is so uh, concerning? Because it's against, um, it is a threat to religious freedom um, because these techniques, uh, surveillance techniques been uh, attracted by, uh, to become very attractive tools for authoritarian dictatorship around the world that has no regard to democratic uh, principles, uh, uh, freedom, human rights. And also, this is also a threat to democratic uh, norms because the governments will be using these techniques to surveil their op political opponents, um, uh, political activists, uh, and, 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 and punish them if necessary. This is also causes national security threat because um, sometimes when people talk about these big giants, tech giants that have, that have been added to the uh, Commerce Department's entity list, as if that this is the United States uh, cooking up something, uh, being fearful of China taking over the world and become the next superpower. Uh, this is a real threat, the technology, uh, the, the tech uh, authoritarianism that China has developed and expanding is, is a huge threat. And, and also this uh, Uyghur genocide has another interesting aspect, which is the China using international institutions uh, such as the UN uh, organization of Islamic Conference to go against American interest, uh, against the interest of the liberal democracies. And this is also a historically very significant thing that the world need to uh, wake up, uh, that we educate, uh, we've been told and also educate the younger generation that no one will be punished because of their race, ethnicity, or religious practices. And this is happening that never again, the promise we've been told never again is happening real time as we speak in communist China. So this is a very, um, there's no longer uh, just a, a typical human rights concern uh, relating to one oppressed ethnic minority uh, in communist China. This is about who we are as a civilization. This is who we are as a nation, uh, a defender of democratic freedom uh, uh, to, to take a position. And uh, this is a, something that is uh, non-controversial, but some people still trying to figure out if they should take a position. All right, let me ask you about the sources of information that the Uyghurs in Xinjiang have. Has the Communist Party so succeeded in monopolizing information, which is their specialty, that the people in Xinjiang don't have outside sources? I mean, can they listen to Radio Free Asia or 
Do they have any means? Can they circumvent the firewall on the internet, et cetera? That's a great question. It's happening in two ways. One, uh, as you are aware that the Chinese kicked out Western reporters, American reporters out of China. Uh, for the first time in the last 20 years, we don't have any reporter on the ground from Washington Post. And, and most of those journalists are starting from uh, Melissa Chen um, in the, in the post July 5 uh, uh, unrest. Uh, everyone happened to be American. There, every time when somebody reports something significant, Wall Street Journal reporter Josh Chen and others, the Chinese find that to be problematic. This is also something that bothers me so much that the, the Western democracies, governments, <laughs> including our own government, not providing the necessary support to our journalists who are supposed to be doing their job, telling the stories reporting from China. And the same rule does not apply. The Chinese reporters are free to uh, come to our country, report, and even advance Chinese disinformation campaign, uh, which is totally unfair. And when it comes to the, the information from United States to to China broadcasting to the Uyghur population. The Chinese have been using jamming techniques to jam Vo uh, Voice of America and, and, and Radio Free Asia for many years. Uh, it's the Radio Free Asia is the only and the first free press, free media outlet for the Uyghur people around the world. For the first time, it still is the only one. Uh, and the Uyghur people took the risk to listen to the broadcast early on. It's hard to know what is the situation now. It appears that the, the, uh, the Chinese cyber police uh, or the people who monitor the information uh, watches the news. It is disheartening that the uh, Chinese government, knowing the role of the Radio Free Asia uh, in exposing the atrocities, particularly in the last three or four years, rounded up the reporters' family members. More than half of the Radio Free Asia Uyghur service reporters have family members in the concentration camps. Uh, the deputy director of the Uyghur service, Mehmet Chan, has been looking for his two missing brothers. The crime was one of them happened to be a Uyghur teacher, the other one is just an artist. So that's the reality. And I, I, am, I am somewhat dumbfounded, uh, uh, perplexed that our government uh, is not doing enough to protect the Radio Free Asia reporters who are risking their lives and their, the lives of uh, their loved ones in China uh, doing what a responsible uh, reporter do. They've been punished for them fulfilling their professional uh, obligation being a US government contractors. That leads to the question, have you ever been threatened or do you have family members remaining in Xinjiang who are punished because of what you've been doing? The Chinese uh, don't engage in physical threats in our soil, on our soil. Uh, I think they know the ramifications, the consequences of such a, uh, uh, illegal activities. But the, what they do is to uh, take either your family as a hostage or threaten uh, with a potential imprisonment of your family to uh, silence you. But to our benefit, uh, the Uyghurs in America uh, is going about with their activism uh, and, and public uh, advocacy for the Uyghur people who have been mistreated by the communist government. Um, I have not seen my mother uh, since my law school graduation in 2004. Uh, I have not uh, been able to bring them out of the country. The Chinese are retaliating against my advocacy work over the years. Uh, my situation is actually less dramatic than compared to the others. There are uh, Uyghur families, uh, Uyghur individuals been directly threatened and their family members been taken to the concentration camps. Uh, we know Uyghur babies have not been touched by their parents, uh, touched by their grandparents. Uh, we know that the Uyghur Americans are being regularly harassed and, and, and uh, pressured by the Chinese either to stay quiet or not to speak out. If they do, there will be more uh, 
family members being detained. The United States government has a law under the mandate of the Uyghur Human Rights uh, Policy Act that President Trump signed into law last June, which specifically directs our FBI, our law enforcement to provide protection to Uyghur American families. The harassment, intimidation, uh, direct, indirect, has been one of the most effective methods that the Chinese use to silence those who are free to speak. Before the profile of what was happening in Xinjiang was raised so successfully by you and others, uh, the most attention was received and has been received for many decades by Tibet. And as you just mentioned, the, the, the secretary of the Tibetan party, Chinese secretary of the Tibetan party was uh, moved over to Xinjiang. Uh, how, how like the, uh, the Chinese policy toward Tibet is their treatment of the Uyghurs and how unlike is it? Or is it- It is very, uh, very <clears throat> similar. Uh, in a sim similar in the way that they uh, formulate, implement policies in one region. If it is successful, they move it to the, another region. Uh, a case in point, uh, this multi uh, uh, bilingual education. Initially, uh, they tested that in the Uyghur homeland. It worked and they are implementing in Tibet. Uh, they built a ro railroad um, uh, to Urumqi and, and the, uh, the major cities. Uh, it built, it helped not only the Chinese to get access to regional natural resources, uh, including the ones uh, in the Uyghur homeland, but also helped to expedite the mass migration. And now that Tibet has a, a, a railroad uh, connecting uh, inland China to Lhasa, they're also uh, uh, targeting uh, religious uh, elites, uh, religious uh, teachers, uh, social elites, uh, scholars uh, in the Uyghur homeland, they're doing the same thing in Tibet, uh, vice versa. They started uh, the uh, um, uh, enslavement of the Uyghurs to provide uh, goods to the global supply chain. Uh, that was effective and no one seemed to really care because we are entrapped in the corporate interest. The, uh, the almighty dollar was very important to many people uh, who are engaging with China in the business uh, spheres. And now that we're seeing a similar trend line in Tibet, uh, the re-education camp initially, uh, the Uyghurs, uh, Uyghur um, religious uh, teachers, uh, leaders taken into this uh, government run uh, daily re-education centers. This was before the con concentration camps were built. No one raised a finger uh, and they are using, uh, they're doing this to monasteries in Tibet. They are plot putting a, a pro-Chinese uh, Uyghur communists in a pop powerful position. Uh, and it was very effective. They do in, in Tibet, the vice versa. So the, they also recycle leadership uh, as the case that I was mentioning. So the, the, the only difference is that when it comes to Tibet, um, uh, the Chinese have been somewhat careful because of the grassroots movement that his holiness the Dalai Lama and his supporters were able to uh, build uh, over the years. Whereas the Uyghur case, it's not a grassroots movement, it's a top-down uh, 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 movement, by, not by design, by nature. Uh, only uh, informed population knows about the Uyghurs, not the general public that much. So there's a global um, sympathy for the Tibetans. I'm speaking in the general terms because the China that we all know before the concentration camps were built because China started this genocidal campaign. Uh, it's a fundamentally different country. So I, 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 I'm mostly speaking in past tense. Uh, so, so the Tibetans are now are kind of uh, forgotten uh, because the, much of the focus were given to the Uyghur people and the Hong Kongers. Uh, I, you know, as a commissioner at the National Religious Freedom Commission, I, I, one of my responsibilities to monitor and cover uh, Tibetan uh, religious freedom. I do raise, but they have not been getting enough attention, uh, uh, especially in the last couple of years. So in one other aspect that's, that's, that is also need to, uh, worth noting that um, the Uyghur Islam and the, the Christianity in China 
are perceived as a Western religion. They are perceiving these religion as a threat to uh, communist ideology. Now there's a new term called uh, Xi Jinping thoughts. Therefore, they are targeting uh, Christians and the Muslims in particular, uh, specifically. When you look at the reports, disturbing the reports that uh, the uh, government bulldozing uh, churches and, and mosques where the Muslims and Christians go to worship and removing cross from the top of the building, removing crescent star from the top of the mosque is something that is becoming quite normal. And also the um, uh, Tibetans don't have this kind of concern, but uh, in the, uh, the place of worship for the Christians and, and, and the Uyghur Muslims, uh, displaying Xi Jinping's picture in the front wall and forcing people to worship him is, is not a religion. So, so because of Chinese uh, government's uh, Communist Party's sense of insecurity, they're using that insecurity uh, as an excuse to repress uh, the others in the case of the Christians and Muslims in China. I know one of the things that the Chinese Communist Party has done is uh, send uh, a large number of Han people into Tibet. And that's been underway for some time in Xinjiang also, hasn't it? It and is, um, you know, the Uyghurs are not a majority in their own capital. Um, the capital city, Rimchi, believed to have more than 80%, uh, more than 80% of the Rimchi population uh, believed to be Han Chinese. Uh, back in 1949, the Han Chinese population was around four to 5%, but now, Based on the official statistics, forty-eight uh, percent. Uh, I I doubt that there's an actual number. It could be higher than that. Uh, the most of the economic opportunities, uh, uh, government-sponsored uh, projects, lucrative projects, are given to the Han Chinese migrants. Uh, since the genocidal campaign started three four years ago, the China is also um, using uh, birth control. Uh, to prevent Uyghur population growth, to dramatically reduce the Uyghur population. Based on the research report, the Uyghur population growth was zero last year. Uh, year before last year, it was uh, declined by 25%. And then previous five years, the Uyghur population declined uh, by 84%. Uh, this was based on the Chinese government's own uh, pub, uh, official statistics. Um, so, the, on top of this birth control, they also trying to use Uyghur women to solve their population problem, the proportion of male and female uh, uh, racial problem. It, on, on its face, it looks innocuous. You know, we live in a free world, a free country that uh, you can marry whomever you love or uh, wanted to build a family with. But in China, the forced marriage, uh, in addition to forced sterilization, forced labor are some of the most uh, effective methods for the communist Chinese government to uh, advance its uh, genocidal policies. I saw a rather startling statement by the Australian uh, Strategic Policy Institute uh, that said, quote, this decline in birth rate is more than double the rate of decline in Cambodia at the height of the Khmer Rouge genocide, unquote. Uh, so this, the, this is being carried out within the context of basically eliminating Uyghur culture? Um, absolutely. Um, this is why that Secretary Pompeo, um, I would say, um, this is particularly uh, important aspect of uh, China's uh, genocidal campaign. And this is one of the reasons that uh, former Secretary Pompeo, Secretary of State Pompeo, uh, felt compelled that uh, the crime, the atrocities being committed against the Uyghur people deserves a proper name, proper uh, determination, uh, proper labeling, if you will. Um, you know, in the genocide, under the Genocide Convention, the uh, the purposeful um, uh, and deliberate uh, prevention of population growth 
and the forcefully removal of Uyghur children, uh, children from their family members are some of the most important uh, uh, requirements to establish the case for genocide. So the information that we had, uh, we have had uh, overwhelming, and this is not something that, uh, you know, you can ignore. Uh, this was something that the Chinese government publishing op an open source uh, venues, bragging about the effectiveness of their population control. This is also based on the Chinese government's own admission uh, bragging about the effectiveness of the state-run orphanages uh, based on various uh, reports, anywhere between 500,000 to 800,000 uh, Uyghur children have been separated from their family members and sent to the uh, uh, state-run orphanages. I gave a talk at the UCLA Law School in November 2019. A young Uyghur uh, student came to me and asked if I could help to save his sister. And I asked uh, what happened to his sister. He said uh, he is at the, she is at the care of uh, his ailing grandmother. And if something happens to grandmother, his grandmother, his sister will be taken to the orphanage. And I asked what happened to your parents? And he said that his parents had been in the concentration camp and his mom was recently moved to the forced labor camp. And at the forced labor camp, even though it's not uh, based on what he described as a, as a prison, she's not allowed to go home to be with uh, eight-year-old uh, little girl. So this is one of the many cases of the Uyghur families being shattered. Uh, there's a slogan uh, by the Chinese government specifically used to uh, justify their policy, uh, which is, which is uh, break the lineage, break the roots, and break the connection. Uh, this was a, a, a key phrase that was used by Human Rights Watch uh, on the cover of the recent report on the atrocities committed against the Uyghur people. Uh, the genocide is an intentional crime. Uh, no one generally, uh, you know, historically allowed to see when the actual crime is committed, just like the way that we found out about the um, uh, Auschwitz and uh, Dachau uh, killing of the Jews uh, after the, the crimes were committed, we will not be able to know what uh, CCP is actually doing on the ground. But based on the facts that we have, based on the survivors' testimonies, uh, one of the camp survivors testified with me uh, at the US Congress for three hours uh, recently and told the horrifying uh, accounts, uh, experiences that she had gone through. And also we have open source information. So it, the, 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 the sheer fact of um, uh, the amount of information that we have, uh, open source information uh, that, that, that was published in the Chinese um, uh, official sites, the satellite imageries, uh, the personal accounts of witness testimonies, uh, uh, the pu publicly available information uh, from the Chinese official um, uh, websites, uh, uh, sources, uh, satellite images, uh, and also uh, investigative reporting done by Western journalists uh, and academic papers written by uh, scholars. And most importantly, the testimonies provided by the camp survivors, as well as the witnesses uh, have given us uh, enough reason to believe that uh, the Chinese government, uh, Communist Party, uh, is engaging in a modern day uh, genocidal campaign against the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims. I know several years ago, Nuri, at a Westminster meeting, uh, a Chinese friend of mine stood up in the audience. He had recently gone back to China and had traveled uh, over to Xinjiang province and as he related what he saw there, he began weeping. He was, it was very powerful. He hadn't been in a camp, but whatever he saw was so profoundly disturbing. That was his reaction. Can you take us through the delineation of uh, the, the various kinds of, of camps? You mentioned at first there was re-education before the camps were opened. Then there were re-education camps. Now there are forced labor camps. 
who is sent to, to, to which, how, how are they put there and who is able to get out? Um, let me untangle that question um, uh, with some of the background <laughs> information. Uh, uh, Human Rights Watch uh, reverse engineered um, a, a platform uh, known as Integrated Joint Operating Platform. The Chinese name for that platform is Yi Ti Hua Shi Tong. The, the Chinese authorities built and uh, used against the Uyghurs uh, early on when they were rounding up uh, individuals who should be rounded up. There's a slogan uh, that was reported uh, um, uh, as part of this leaked documents. So in um, based on the Human Rights Watch report on this uh, platform, IJOP, and all that is substantiated by uh, China cables, leaked uh, to the media uh, a year and so ago, uh, shows the um, arbitrary nature of the uh, roundup. Um, Xi Jinping told his henchmen, uh, uh, absolutely no mercy. Uh, and also this guy Chen Zhuanguo, uh, who got sanctioned, uh, who is running this operation uh, some people dubbed him as a uh, modern day Adolf Heichmann, uh, basically told that anyone, everyone should be rounded up uh, if they need to be rounded up. So that vagueness, um, that the, the broad uh, order even puzzled uh, the police officers early on. So China Cable, and uh, this was uh, something that was um, very helpful for the international community policy makers to know actually what is happening. Had some information rather chilling that uh, in summer 2017, uh, the IJOP generated uh, arrest list, a list of uh, individuals who should be arrested. Uh, and the number was around 20,000. The police cannot come up with that 20,000 people. They were able to identify them uh, in the system, but the actual presence of those people are not there. They were able to locate 16,000. And then they, uh, they got pressured by their superiors. They added another thousand. So in that 10 days alone, the Chinese police arrested, uh, rounded up 17,000 Uyghurs just in 10 days, just one incident. Uh, that 17,000 people's lives are shattered. So what kind of people caught up in this? Um, people like, you know, um, uh, who the individuals who are influential. And this also reminds us the way that uh, Hitler rounded up Jews, like the Uyghur uh, philanthropist, uh, business leaders, community leaders, religious leaders, professors, uh, scholars, uh, stage actors, uh, athletes, shop owners, uh, you name it. Anyone who are uh, perceived, who are perceived as somebody who are influential uh, with the travel history, publication history, speaking history, social engagement, philanthropic history, uh, big bank, bank accounts, uh, a large um, uh, a, a bibliogra bibliography uh, for publishing, speaking, and uh, schooling. So they rounded up uh, anyone who should be rounded up in summer 2017. So, and then at the same time uh, in 2018, um, S. Aspie um, that you referred earlier and BBC reported this massive uh, camp expansion. A, a Chinese student in, in Vancouver uh, by the name Shan Zhang uh, used his technical skills to identify camps. Uh, through satellite imagery. So based on the various reports reported in 2019, the number of camps uh, were built uh, around that time was around 1300. Uh, this is just uh, the, some people, you, you name it, internment camp, re-education camp, concentration camp. But these are very similar type of camps that we have uh, learned uh, from the history books. They are extrajudicial, arbitrary, and they are based on uh, the individuals locked up based on their ethnicity and religious background. 
and also they will never be uh, allowed to leave. If they allowed to leave, there no, no explanation is provided or no apologies provided. So this is very similar to the camps uh, that we have uh, uh, seen in the history. So it's a concentration camp. Uh, regardless, that number in of itself, the size of those camps, uh, one of these reports that I were referring, uh, compare these camps to um, a, a, the expansion um, the, the expansion of these camps to uh, multiple sides of the uh, soccer fields uh, in a quite staggering uh, comparison. Uh, and, and that's one type. So what other type of camps do they have? Um, early on, they had uh, daily re-education camps. Uh, if you have perceived as someone who is less dangerous or have a lesser problem, uh, you go to your uh, work unit, university, hospital, you attend daily re-education for a fixed period of time. You go home at night, three months, six months, nine months. That is the most favored. Actually, that's the kind of a lifesaver uh, re-education uh, situation. The second time is internment camp or concentration camp. You just disappear. Um, I recently interviewed a camp teacher who was based in the Netherlands about her experience, uh, it's quite horrifying. So you, it, it's a poorly conditioned uh, uh, places. There's sexual rampant sexual violence, uh, poor hygiene, poor nutrition. In one instance, I was told by um, one of the survivors that they have to sleep in the sideways to save space or give provide more space. So it's overcrowded. Just imagine that the nation's capital, Washington DC, has 750,000 people living there as a resident. So even if you just use 1 million figure, it's, the big, it's more people than the people in the District of Columbia. So that gives you an idea how, how massive this internment uh, situation was. And then the second, uh, uh, the third type is the actual prison camps. Uh, you know, you. Uh, arbitrarily get sentenced to anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 years. Our fellow American citizens here in our, in our country have been looking for their missing family members. American children have not been able to touch their grandparents uh, because they're in the concentration camps. And if you just Google Uyghur Americans, um, the concentration camps, you will find um, heartbreaking stories about our fellow citizens. And then the other type is the forced labor camp that is feeding the global supply chain, which is to me is the most horrifying thing that uh, the uh, horrifying thing that the citizens of the world feel so much related to. And then the finally, the orphanage, the state run uh, orphanages. Uh, I came to know a gentleman um, in Turkey who recognizes missing child in a state-run uh, orphanage propaganda video. So daily re-education, uh, the mass internment camps, concentration camps, forced labor camps, prison camps, and the orphanage. There are five types of camps being built. Uh, and also we, we cannot ignore the, the ones who are not on those camps, the people who are at home in the society. In summer 2019, New York Times published a thought-provoking piece about the digital surveillance. And in it, this reporter said that he was standing in the street corner. He counted 20 surveillance cameras pointing at him in one location. The Uyghur families have a QR code. The, every aspect of Uyghur families, Uyghur individuals are surveilled and monitored. Uh, who is in, out, everything is monitored. Uh, one of my friends um, managed to um, take a detour uh, from his uh, business trip to China, wanted to pay a visit to his family. He was not allowed to see his sister because his iris samples are not profiled. He wasn't allowed to go into the, the compound to visit his sister. And his sister could not come out to say hello to him because he's an American citizen, she's a Chinese citizen. Uh, palling around with Americans. Uh, America is one of the 26 countries that the Chinese uh, punish you if you have a travel history and if you're under the Uyghur skin. So they, 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 the American citizen, this is a successful businessman who was in China for business, could not even give a hug to his sister. Uh, 
um, because of that um, uh, situation outside of the, um, uh, the camp. The State Department recently published, uh, released annual uh, uh, religious freedom report at the uh, press conference. Uh, the top official in the Earth Office, International Religious Freedom Office, said that the Chinese government created an open prison-like environment for the Uyghurs in China. Uh, and also their homes. Uh, Dar Darren Byler, the American scholar, uh, wrote uh, for the Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy magazine uh, a couple of years ago after his visit. Uh, in it, he describes uh, one million men, uh, men and women from the Chinese um, Aprachik, Communist Party Aprachik, moved in to live and uh, uh, live with the Uyghur families who has no male house, household for the most part were taken into the camps. So those uninvited Chinese um, cadres sleep and eat with the Uyghur uh, families. And in some instances, as reported in this piece, the Uyghur children asked to spy on their parents. Uh, do they read Quran? Do they pray? Uh, do they uh, punish the kid if they're not speaking Uyghur? Uh, do they criticize the government, uh, express grievances? So this is horrible. I mean, in any aspect, I, I, I know my, uh, you know, I generally don't have a problem explaining something, but the, the, the scale and scope of the problem that, that the Chinese are putting the Uyghurs through, the Communist Party officials, beyond words. I, I just cannot come up with a proper word to describe uh, the awful nature of the atrocities. Um, recently, a very successful businessman asked me to brief him uh, here in our country. Uh, he asked me a very simple question after describing this hor horrifying story, harrowing stories, uh, experiences. He said, why do they hate you that much? I could not come up with a uh, plausible answer. I do know the answer, but uh, it was not the right occasion to give him that answer. What is the answer? Hatred, racism. Mm -hmm. Communist Party is the most uh, racist uh, political entity around the world. To the Communist Party, uh, if you just happen to be other, or uh, if you're not singing the same song, uh, phrasing the same leaders, the supreme leader, uh, aligning your ideology with that sick ideology, communist ideology, then you are a problem for them. No country on the face of the universe treats the Muslims the way that the Communist Party treats. No country and no political entity around the world as racist as the CCP. This is all about racism. When you've mentioned re-education, uh, have you ever seen the curriculum that the Communist Party uses in these re-education camps? You mentioned uh, they're using the thought of Xi Jinping. Uh, to what extent is that just standard Marxist-Leninism and to what extent is it something else? Yeah, I've I've seen um, I've seen the, um, the China cable. Uh, initially, they showed to me the BBC Panoramic uh, was working on a, a documentary, uh, and that China cable, that one particular document, my immediate reaction was uh, Nazi playbook. Uh, it basically provides scripts, you know, what to say, what not to say, if somebody asks about their missing family members. And it's also, it has very specific guidelines, instructions as to how to conduct business in those camps. Uh, teach like a school, uh, guard like a prison, manage like, a, uh, manage like a prison and guard like a military. That's the slogan that they use uh, about these camps. So based on my uh, interactions and conversations, multiple conversations with the camp survivors, uh, the daily routine starts with uh, a flag raising ceremony in the early morning hours, uh, pledging allegiance to the Communist Party, uh, chanting pro-CCP, uh, pro-motherland, the China slogans uh, in the morning, early morning hours. And then you go back into the camp and then you will spend the whole morning studying uh, Xi Jinping thoughts. To the Chinese government, uh, the 
Uyghur Islam, uh, Uyghur's way of life is a thought virus. So in, in some of these uh, leaked documents, uh, the Chinese officials said that you cannot clear out the weeds one by one. You have to spray chemical. So your, um, uh, you know, the diversity that we appreciate in liberal societies like ours is perceived as a thought virus. So the curriculum specifically targeted, oh, where is your God? Why your God is not here? Xi Jinping is the God. Mihrigul Tursun, one of the camp survivors, told um, uh, in, his, in her Senate, um, excuse me, um, one of the camp survivors by the name Mihrigul Tursun, who was in the news, uh, told uh, senators uh, in the CECC hearing uh, that uh, she was told to recite that Xi Jinping is her God. Is Islam the enemy to the CCP? Uh, in the Chinese constitution and uh, China's uh, uh, autonomous law, the autonomy law, uh, religious freedom is something that's not only allowed, it is something that is protected. But the Chinese government has a you know, tradition, habit and practice of breaking their own uh, domestic laws, let alone international agreements uh, or treaty obligations. They violate everything that they sign on uh, under the international law. They violate anything, everything that they sign on on regional security issues, uh, regional autonomy. Look at what happened to Hong Kong. So similarly, that the Chinese has uh, a pledge uh, through the autonomy law that the Uyghurs not only allowed to practice, but the state protects that religious uh, identity. And yet, because of this perceived threat, this preemptive policing, this enemy that the Chinese created in Uyghur Islam, and also uh, some responsibility that the Western democracy should bear, allowing Chinese to misuse the US-led uh, war on terrorism in, in after 9-11, as an excuse to uh, crush the Uyghur aspiration for social political freedom. So when you look at the actual policies uh, that kept the Chinese um, energized uh, and, and to the extent miscalculated the out outcome is all about their targeted uh, uh, destructive attempts on Uyghur Islam. Uh, Washington Post, um, columnist uh, Fred Hyatt uh, wrote in a column uh, a year or so ago, uh, the title of that um, column is, Every Day is Kristallnacht for the Uyghur People. Oh my. Uh, so that is the case. Uh, why China is so uh, Islamophobic? Uh, that Islamophobia only allows them to achieve uh, their domestic agenda, uh, secure their leadership, a position uh, on the home front, but conversely, that Islamophobia has not been appreciated by the Muslim countries. The countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Iran, countries like Pakistan, uh, even Palestine uh, support uh, the Chinese way of treating its Muslim population. It's very confusing. And I don't understand uh, someone like MBS was claimed to be groomed to be the custodian of the two holiest mosques for the uh, Muslim people, goes to Beijing, does not even bother to challenge his host, Xi Jinping. Uh, General Secretary Xi, do you have any problem with my name? Because the name Mohammed is banned. And he should have asked Mr. General Secretary if he wants to call him president, so be it. Any problem me saying assalamu alaikum? What is wrong with it? Do you have any problem with my religion? What can I do to help? Instead of saying or asking one simple question, what's wrong with my name? He leaves Beijing with a full of phrases in the backdrop of the concentration camps and the genocidal campaign. So the Islamophobia um, has been uh, not only uh, not been recognized publicly, but also uh, come kind of a useful techniques uh, for the uh, Chinese state to rally support. Secretary Pompeo has this uh, uh, memorable line uh, in one of his press conferences that uh, China has its own league. 
when it comes to human rights violations. And, and ironically, this, despite CCP's Islamophobic and racist nature, uh, the countries that are lending support standing behind CCP, for the most part, are Muslim majority countries. That's the irony of the world that we live in. Can you be more specific about what's been done inside Xinjiang? I mean, do, do, do we know how many mosques have been destroyed? Do they allow imams to openly operate? You mentioned uh, getting children to report on their parents. Are they reading the Quran? Um, do they try to confiscate Qurans, interfere with prayer, uh, with other observances like Ramadan? Are, are Muslims allowed to freely observe that? Can you describe more fully the level of interference? The sinicization of uh, mm -hmm. religion in China has been ongoing. Mm -hmm. Um, so they wanted to align or they wanted to uh, allow uh, handpicked uh, religious practitioners to practice sanctioned form of religion, whether it be Christianity, uh, Tibetan Buddhism or Islam. The wholesale attack on Uyghur Islam started actually uh, soon after 9-11. Uh, early on, uh, they are put, they put restriction on the individuals who can go to Mecca for an annual pilgrimage. Uh, who re uh, and then uh, the government restricted students, women, or anyone who is under eighteen to enter the place of worship to uh, practice their religion, particularly in the Islamic faith. They put signs at the entrance to the mosque. Uh, American scholar uh, Drew Gladney uh, wrote about this uh, using those images uh, or the uh, post hang on the uh, entrance to the mosque. Specifically said, no Muslim woman, uh, no Muslim children, no one, no uh, state employee are allowed to practice. This was the, uh, the this was in itself was a very intrusive way of interfering in somebody's uh, uh, relationship with the Almighty God. That was in of itself as wrong practice against the China's own domestic laws, uh, regulations, if you will, or even propaganda documents. But after the uh, after Xi Jinping come to power, after this uh, Chinese Edel Heikman put into power, they become so naked, so abrasive, uh, so aggressive. Um, um, I talked to one of the camp survivors and she told me even her brother's uh, uh, cemetery were forced to be relocated. She basically went to the cemetery that where her brother was buried um, and uh, put the bones in the, uh, in the, in the bag and, and take it to the different location. So they're destroying the- uh, Why? 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 Why would they do something like that? Because uh, the Uyghurs go to the cemeteries to pray. Uh. They're turning them into kind of a guarded um, iris scan machines are installed, uh, uh, cameras, monitor, camera monitored uh, a, a place so that they can monitor who is religious, who is not. Uh, so that is what, what was happening publicly and in private, uh, the religious freedom has always been an issue for the Uyghurs, but uh, the Uyghurs were allowed to, you know, keep the lights on, put black cur curtain on their uh, kitchen windows during the month of Ramadan. I've seen it. I grew up in such an environment, and uh, keeping Quran not in display somewhere within the books, um, or keeping the prayer mat somewhere under the blanket. Uh, it was allowed, as long as you don't show it outside as long as you don't flash it on the face of the Chinese uh, police, uh, you were okay with it. Uh, and now under the current circumstance, uh, one of the most uh, um, disturbing act aspects of this roundup was targeting, uh, was on uh, the religious pious Uyghur uh, population. So if you kept the prayer mat, uh, if you, privately teach your children religious values. If you kept a copy of a Quran, uh, then you're in trouble. So the, the cease, and, uh, 
a search and seizure early on was one of the methods. This was before the idea OP was utilized. Uh, so what are they doing? They, can, they are collecting, uh, confiscating Quran, prayer mats, and burning them. Uh, there's images we've seen that they were Quran burning. Uh, in the United States, I remember an incident and somebody was uh, messing around with a, a, a holy book of Quran. There was an outrage. In China, people criminalized keeping a Quran and no one seemed to care except for a few countries. They're also uh, destroying the mosques. Uh, there are images available online. Uh, the Uyghur Human Rights Project that I co-founded 17 years ago uh, profiled uh, before and after images using technology to uh, issue this report. If you go to uhrp.org on the report section, you will find this uh, disturbing report. Uh, and also, uh, one other thing that they're also doing during the month of Ramadan is forcing uh, Uyghur, pious Uyghurs to drink. And uh, I, I apologize for those uh, who likes bacon in their breakfast. But uh, we, uh, Muslim, Muslim people don't eat pork, uh, forcing uh, individuals to eat pork, drinking during the month of Ramadan. I mean, you just uh, uh, completed the month of Ramadan. And this Ramadan was particularly difficult uh, that uh, the government sent the Chinese individuals to the Uyghur homes to make a, a Chinese dumpling with a pork. And if you refuse to eat, or if you refuse to drink, that is a sign of uh, extremism. In April 1, 2017, the Chinese local government in Xinjiang published uh, or legislated something called de-extremification measures. Uh, in it, there are listed 50 behaviors that could uh, lend you into the concentration camp because those are the signs of extremism. That includes refusing to smoke, refusing to uh, drink, refusing to um, allow your uh, children to marry someone who is not Uyghur, who is not Muslim, uh, wearing a headscarf, uh, growing beard, even if it's for stylistic reason. So those are the things. Uyghurs uh, traditionally have mustache. Uh, that's a sign of manhood. Uh, Uyghurs also very stylistic people. Uh, they like to dress up, um, and men particularly they have really nice groomed uh, facial hair. That has also uh, been used as an excuse to uh, 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 used used that as an excuse uh, to uh, either uh, sent to the re-education camps or being re-educated uh, if if it's treated with the lesser um, uh, criminal behaviors, if you will. So, so it's becoming mandatory to violate the tenets of your faith. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the uh, Albanian scholar who was uh, part of the uh, Potemkin village visit uh, sponsored by the Chinese government uh, was very skillful. He interviewed the camp uh, uh, detainees asking, uh, do you think that you're Muslim? And the detainee cannot say she is a Muslim. And in some interviews, those detainees said, no, they're not Muslim. For the Uyghur people, I think this is very important. Anyone who is a devout religious practitioner could appreciate if somebody forced you to denounce your God, renounce your religion, how psychologically damaging that could be. Anyone, anyone, I mean, this is not that difficult to appreciate. So that is the routine both inside the camp and then outside the camp that the communist leadership uh, thought that these uh, adherence, the adherence to these uh, uh, um, values, don't cheat, don't steal, uh, don't lie, uh, loving, caring, forgiving, shared by Abrahamic uh, religious practitioners seem to be problematic uh, proposition to the communist leadership. And they're just targeting as things as simple as that you're not drinking. That should be personal choice. Uh, conceiving, not conceiving, should be personal choice. Uh, the government should have no business how many children that you should have. The government should not force you to uh, put IUI uh, if knowing that you're over 50 had no interest in conceiving another child. 
this uh, camp survivor, a camp teacher that I interviewed and been reported in the news um, uh, recently uh, told the reporters and including myself that while she was over 50, the government forced her to insert the IUI. Um, so that's the nature of, again, this brings us back to the question, why do they hate you so much? Are they employing forced abortions against Uyghurs? Not only forced abortion, um, forced sterilization to both male and female individuals. Uh, the, the gang rape uh, in the concentration camps also recently reported by BBC and CNN. There's a camp survivor here in Washington area who were subjected to that kind of uh, uh, brutal treatment. Um, forced abortion um, uh, was something was already in practice. This is why that uh, during the period of 2014 and 2019, the Uyghur population growth would drop by 84%. So this was already in practice before the genocidal campaign really technically started in late 2016. Back in 20, uh, like in, in the 90s and 80s, the, the Chinese, because of the family planning, because of this preferential treatment that they always like to brag about, the Uyghur women are allowed to have two kids uh, if there was a waiting period between the first uh, three years, if they fulfill the waiting period between the sec first and the second one. Uh, in the rural areas, if you had two girls and the third one was also allowed. But the Uyghurs are very, very religious people. Uh, they live their life by, uh, you know, worshiping God. So if you conceive, once you conceive, individuals don't think that is the choice for him or any government to abort that child. It's God's child. That's how Uyghur women uh, strictly believe, particularly in the rural areas. But the government don't have that kind of sensibility, don't have uh, decency, uh, thought that this is something that they have no tolerance. And they had family planning commission in their neighborhoods. Um, I dealt with asylum applicants um, several years ago who were in their uh, late 30s uh, and early 40s, went through that kind of brutal uh, process. Not only they were forced to abort the child, God's child, but they're also not given uh, proper health uh, support, resulting in various illnesses like bleeding, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, uh, and, and various uh, STDs afterward because of the um, unclean environment they went through, uh, substandard environment they went through these kind of procedures. Uh, Nuri, I'd like to just touch a little bit more on the social surveillance. Um, as is widely known, China is instituting a social credit system throughout the entire country. Um, those surveillance cameras, uh, which you mentioned are omnipresent. Is, is, is this in a more severe form than Xinjiang? How does this the social is, credit system work there? This is, again, this, uh, the social credit system uh, sounds <laughs> innocuous. Some, some China apologists always said, oh, we have a social, uh, we have a credit scoring system in the United States. It's different. That credit scoring system is for commercial purposes for the most part in the United States. In China, social credit system is for control, monitoring, surveilling the population. The most Chinese people uh, fall into that trap. And some China apologists uh, oftentimes try to use what we have in the West as an excuse. It's not, this is about surveillance of their population. Uh, the, everything that you do, money transaction, uh, booking of flight tickets, train tickets, movements around, it's all controlled by the Chinese government. This government needs, uh, people need to know something about China. Uh, this is extremely important that because of the persuasiveness and, and surveillance apparatus, the, the type of money that they invested uh, on these 
methods to con uh, for social control or people con controlling the population. China spends more money on domestic security than national defense. That is telling. That shows how insecure, uh, how brutal, how intrusive this government is. But the social credit, some people think that, oh, the surveillance techniques were developed, um, uh, tested, implemented, now exported to other parts of China. Actually, it's reverse. The, the, the technology firms, the big ones that we read in the news, the ZTE, the Higvision, uh, Tencent uh, that runs the uh, popular platform WeChat, initially started in inland China and then they expanded to other parts. Of, but what is different is that in inland China, the social credit system was used to control the general public. Whereas in the Uyghur homeland, the technology uh, coupled with this something already established used for the genocide of Kim. It's a tech genocide. It's a modern day genocide aided, supported, uh, facilitated by technology. So it's different. And now what, what, why I think this is so particularly important to average Americans, average Europeans, um, average Australians, Canadian, to know that this very technology that has been used against the Uyghur people and the Angaon genocide, if not stopped, will give the world, uh, give us a civilization's much, much bigger problem. Well, in our closing minutes, Nori, could you talk about the international reaction to this? Uh, which countries have denounced it? I noticed recently the Lithuanian parliament issued a denunciation of China's behavior in Xinjiang. Uh, who, who's serious about it? I mean, you mentioned Secretary Pompeo. The U.S. has applied sanctions. Um, the, the new administration under President Biden seems to be adhering to uh, this policy and uh, profiling the Uyghur atrocities in a, in a very major and serious way. Who, who else? What about the European Union, Germany? You, you, you already mentioned the abysmal reaction in Muslim majority countries that they're, they're taking a pass or they've been bought off. What about the democracies of the world? You can, can, you can imagine the type of reaction uh, from the international community if any country other than China locks up that many of its Muslim citizens, right? It, it's just unthinkable that uh, we're talking about the year four of the ongoing genocide. And yet people still trying to see this as another problem that they have no relevance to uh, generally. But governmentally, I think the problem that the China were able to, has been able to create uh, in the last 10, 20 years uh, that the previous administration uh, was rightfully exposed and the current administration is continuing it's something that people need to know that this problem was created uh, with the help of the business community, uh, some thought leaders, some academics, um, some lobbyists to normalize this regime uh, as something that we can do business with. And then the Chinese used that very advantage that the United States helped them to obtain a secure technology, education, uh, it, uh, uh, the, that the very influence that the United States helped them to build uh, in a technological, economic, um, and diplomatic areas have been used against uh, the U.S. effort to uh, get the countries to realize that this is a serious problem and they should be on the U.S. side, on the right of right side of the history. Secretary Pompeo organized a number of uh, trips uh, 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 starting late 2019, including the one to Central Asia, including uh, the meetings that he had uh, with uh, European leaders. Uh, uh, he even take the case to Vatican. Uh, that groundwork was already laid uh, 
at, before the Biden administration come to office. After the Biden administration came to office, I think Secretary Blinken deserves credit for being able to rally support from our traditional allies and partners. Uh, the, I think the second most vocal country as we speak, uh, other than the United States, perhaps UK. Uh, United Kingdom, uh, particularly the parliament, has been uh, quite vocal. Uh, they have passed, uh, uh, they have officially recognized the atrocities as genocide. Uh, Canada did the same thing. So did uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the New Zealand parliament was kind of recognized, not explicitly used the language, but they acknowledged that there's a, a severe human rights problem. So that's, it's a good uh, public statement, pu uh, public response, but they have not done the things that the United States government has done so far, except for the coordinated sanctions announced in March, uh, UK and European Union and Canada. Uh, most of the, much of the world is still sleeping at switch. Uh, we, have not heard from, we have not heard from the German chancellor we have not heard from the French president. Uh, we have not uh, heard from uh, the UN secretary general, nothing, zero. Uh, the United States, uh, the previous and current administration altogether announced 74 punitive sanctions against the Chinese uh, government officials and entities, including the entity list designation, the visa ban, the global Magnitsky sanction. And the United States Congress uh, enacted the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act last June. There are, there are uh, several bills currently being considered, including the one uh, uh, would address the modern day slavery, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Uh, and then there's another one, Uyghur Protection Act uh, that addresses uh, the refugee issues. So the United States government has done its due. What is lacking right now is the global effort uh, not in a tepid, uh, meandering fashion, but in a bold, uh, kind of a Churchillian response. You know, this is, this is not about the China anymore. Uh, this is on us. No one can say he or she did not know. Everyone knows. If you flip through the paper every day, you'll be hard pressed not to see anything related to the Uyghurs being reported. Every day, almost every day. I uh, hardly can keep up with it myself. And also, this has been in the highest level of the US government being discussed, uh, the national community should stop uh, tiptoeing around. If they really care about uh, human rights, if they really care about the values, the values that we cherish in the liberal democracies, they need to step up to the plate. If they really think it's not okay to use consumer products made by enslaved Uyghurs, they need to step up it's, if it's not okay for their athletes to compete in the upcoming Winter Olympics in Beijing. The, the history does not repeat itself. We allow history to repeat. In 1936, uh, in the face of calling for boycott, 49 countries attended the Nazi uh, Olympic. Guess what happened? At three years after that Olympic, Hitler invaded Europe. Should we be concerned about uh, Beijing doing something, taking some action after next year's uh, summer uh, winter Olympics? I don't understand why people think it's okay to go to attend Olympics or compete in a, a game that promotes uh, friendship and spirit uh, in the backdrop of the concentration camps and in the backdrop of the ongoing genocidal campaign against fellow human beings. Mary Turkle, thank you very much for the very powerful and moving testimony you have given. I'm afraid we're out of time today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we invite you to go to the Westminster Institute webpage to see the other talks that have been given, uh, certainly a number of them on China, Russia, and other foreign policy issues. I'm Bob Riley, and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you.